Hi, I'm Laura and this is Trip Trend Trilogy and today we are starting my new series on writing natural disasters. I have to start with a confession because I lied to you. This series is actually not about writing natural disasters, so um, we'll just cross that out right there. I spent so much time doing all that detail, just cross it out. This series is actually about writing natural hazards, so yeah. Now don't get me wrong, don't go if you want to learn about natural disasters because some of the natural hazards are natural disasters but not all of them are. In fact, a lot of people tend to use the word natural disaster when really they might mean something else. However, they all fit under the category of natural hazard. If that makes sense, I'll explain further later. But in my defense, my textbook lied too, so it's not just me. It's, it's just how people talk. Anyway, the reason I wanted to do a series on this is because in college, I took a course on natural hazards. Also, I'd like to thank my professor, Jeffrey Halverson. And I was absolutely fascinated by it, and I feel like it applies to a lot of fiction, or it could apply to a lot of fiction that you plan on writing. You could be writing a classic disaster story, an apocalypse, a post-apocalypse, a historical fiction, or even a fantasy or sci-fi that happens to include a natural hazard in it. The point is, this is actually pretty relevant to a lot of writing and stories, and even if you aren't personally writing one of these, it's really interesting, so I think it's a series that you would still probably enjoy. Also, I might give you some tips on how not to die. And you'd be surprised how many stories involve natural hazards. Armageddon, The Fifth Wave, Twister, Hildago, The Day After Tomorrow, Interstellar, and The Walking Dead. And of course, there's a lot more, but I picked the more obvious ones. Also, some of these are more accurate than others. Ooh, and also War of the Worlds includes a natural hazard. However, this hazard affects the aliens more than the humans. However, the truth is I did put off doing the series, and that's because it's a lot of science, and though I'm not going to claim to be an expert, I did want to make it accurate. And this past fall, I actually worked as an environmental educator at a specific camp, and doing so, I taught classes involving science, the environment, and natural hazards, which has given me a bit more confidence in discussing these topics. I will be talking about more, and if you request any, I will try to talk about them to the best of my ability. Also, be warned, natural hazards are tragic and can be pretty depressing, so this series you might not want to watch this some of the videos if you're already in a downer mood and might want to wait till you feel a bit better and also I will give examples of real life natural hazards where people have died I will list below which ones I talk about and linking the timestamps also first of all you should be doing research outside of my videos if you want to write these but these videos are a good stepping stone for things that you might not even think to research in the first place because how can you research something if you don't know that you're supposed to so this is will be helpful with that also I will be talking about the actual hazards themselves however I will also be talking about the repercussions specific examples aftermath and preparation also though I highly recommend a documentary series called Nova I watched them for school they've made really in-depth and super entertaining while also scientifically accurate and full of science documentaries that sentence was a run-on I don't know if it was grammatically correct but the point is definitely recommend you check them out if you want more info. Anyway, let's get back to the natural hazards info. What is a natural hazard and how is it different than a natural disaster? So, a natural hazard is the actual event. It is a natural phenomenon that might have a negative effect on humans and the environment. Natural hazards occur every day and they affect millions of lives each year. Natural hazards are caused by different energy sources. There are four main sources of energy, however, they do overlap. The first source is heat from the sun. It's the most massive source of energy and it creates 
4,000 times the amount of energy as the other sources each day. It is the uneven heating of the earth that causes weather, specifically the severe weather such as hurricanes and tornadoes, and it can also assist in causing wildfires. The second source of energy is geophysical energy, so that is the tectonic plates, which I don't entirely know where they are. Um, there's one in the Atlantic. Um, whoops. Whoops, already messed up, but tectonic plates. The geophysical energy is caused by the heat within the earth and the liquid mantle. The tectonic plates are solid on the mantle, whereas the mantle, due to being liquid, is constantly moving and reacting due to the heat, which results in the tectonic plates on top moving, which can create earthquakes and volcanoes. When the magma from the mantle escapes in the form of lava, either at the break of two tectonic plates or in a hot spot, which in turn can also cause landslides and tsunamis. The third source of energy for natural disasters is gravity. Gravity is potential energy, so if this rock is on the top of the hill, it has the potential energy given by its height, and then it rolling down the hill is a potential energy being converted into the fourth source of energy, kinetic energy. So again, Gravity, the third source, can cause landslides, flash floods, mudslides. Volcanic ash ejected into the atmosphere also has potential energy, whereas kinetic energy is the energy of the actual motion, which can be the motion, again, from going down, or it can be the motion of the Earth rotating. It is the actual landslide lava flow. And also, a meteor crashing into the Earth is the energy of its motion, coming into the earth system. So when a natural hazard does affect human lives, there are three main categories of severity. These categories are not actually based on the size of the event itself, but actually based on how it affects human lives, how it affects property and the economy, and how it affects natural resources aka the environment. And it's based on the scale at which aid comes from, again, local, national, international. So the smallest one, category number one, is a natural emergency, which is a local scale. This is the smallest one. This is when the natural hazard can be handled locally. And it tends to be smaller scale events such as mudslides or tornadoes. Number two is the most well-known name and that is a natural disaster, which is on the national level. This event is handled within the nation. For example, Hurricane Sandy. And number three is the biggest one and that is a natural catastrophe. And that is handled on the international level. This is the worst category and it is when the event requires international aid. And one thing to note is it's not entirely based on the amount of damage in that a country that is less prepared to handle a natural hazard might be bumped up to a natural catastrophe because they need international aid. Whereas another country could have an event of the same scale but be a natural disaster because they can take care of it themselves. And the example of a natural catastrophe is the earthquake in Haiti. Now, harming the natural environment, such as forest and wildlife, is a severe outcome of natural disasters. However, the two most important outcomes of a natural disaster that qualifies what category it is, is one, property loss. Now, this does include natural resources, such as the environment and wildlife. However, it also includes buildings, homes, jobs, and hurting the economy. And the second category is human life. Now, this can be people who die during the actual event, but it also includes people who die in the aftermath. And in a less severe note, it can also include people who are sick or injured due to the event, and it doesn't mean they have to die. However, that is a more severe outcome. But on a positive note, usually more people are injured than die due to natural disasters, so... It, it does include them and they make up most of the number and hopefully no one dies. So my professor actually created his own little chart to demonstrate what is more likely to occur in every, any given location. And this is known as Halverson's Law of Natural Disasters. So it is a little chart right here and he said that if anyone has any suggestions on how to improve it, to tell him, but for right now, it is property loss on the y-axis and deaths on the x-axis. And this is just a visual way to demonstrate how a country that is wealthy tends to have a lot of property loss and not as many deaths, whereas a poorer country doesn't lose as much 
money but has more debt. And the reason for this is that a wealthier country has more money to lose in the first place. They have more infrastructure to be destroyed, they have a larger economy, and it generally is just because they have more to lose when it comes to property value. They also have less debts because they have greater infrastructure that is less likely to collapse on someone, and they also have more resources to help people and keep them alive in the aftermath, whereas a poorer country, again, has a smaller economy, less expensive things to be destroyed so they lose less property-wise, but they also don't have as much to help keep people alive. The buildings might be less well-built to keep people alive, and also there just isn't as much money to help people in the aftermath. The law of rare events. It is when the frequency of reoccurrence is inversely related to the magnitude of the actual event, which is why weak hazards are more likely than violent ones. So if you think of it like a pyramid, most will only be emergencies, the next most being disasters, and finally, catastrophes are the least likely. So when writing a story, you need to know if the event makes sense. You're not going to get a crazy dust storm on Mars since the atmospheric pressure is too low. <coughs> the Martian. However, I will say I'm not smart enough to have figured that out myself. And I actually learned that from my professor who mentioned it. However, he also said that the rest of the science in the book slash movie is great, so still recommend. Anyway, the types of natural hazards are earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis. I don't actually know if this area gets tsunamis, but I need a drill somewhere, so tsunamis. Volcanoes, fires, floods, landslides. Can you, can you tell it's a landslide? That's a little mountain. There, it's covered. Landslides, tornadoes, meteors, heat waves, cold fronts, blizzards, sandstorms, droughts, and infectious diseases. And probably more that I didn't think of. The vulnerability to a natural hazard is equal to the size of the natural hazard times the risk. The risk is the amount of infrastructure that is there to be destroyed and the population. Meaning that if there's more people, there's more people to get hurt. So a greater population increases the risk. However, it does not increase the amount of natural hazard. Also, to give an example of why the rating scale is based on the amount of damage and not the magnitude of the event itself, I'm going to give you an example. July 5th, 2019, there was an earthquake near Southern California's Ridgecrest. Though there was property damage, not a single person died and there was only minor injuries, which is great. The earthquake was a magnitude 7.1 on the Richter scale. That is a major earthquake. However, despite the amount of energy in the earthquake being enough to power New York City for a year, not a single person died. And it was only a natural emergency because it only needed to be handled on the local level. And it was lucky it wasn't in a more populated area such as LA, which was pretty close by. And it was also a good thing the buildings were built structurally sound enough that even though they were damaged, none of them collapsed on anyone. So it was a combination of the luck of the location having less people, but also how well the buildings were built. In contrast, on January 12, 2010, there was an earthquake in Haiti. This earthquake earthquake was a magnitude 7 on the Richter scale. So though it was 0.1 smaller than the natural emergency I just spoke about, this earthquake was a natural catastrophe. And don't get me wrong, this earthquake is still massive and can still power New York for a year. Three million people were affected by this earthquake and the death toll is reported to be 230,000 people, though it is probably more. And that's another thing to take note. When a natural hazard originally occurs, the death toll usually climbs partially due to finding out that more people is dead, but also partially due to more people dying as the recovery process goes on due to disease or the injuries finally killing them. And the earthquake in Haiti is no doubt a natural catastrophe. Part of this is because it was in a lot more populated area with people more condensed together. And it was also partially due to the infrastructure not being as well built. A lot of the buildings have cement walls, which when shaken in an earthquake, turn to powder and they have metal roofs. So the walls will turn to powder and while the roof collapses. Not only was this earthquake a natural catastrophe on its own, it caused a second natural catastrophe. And this was a cholera outbreak. Cholera got into the country when foreign aid came in and accidentally spread it to the people of Haiti, while also the people of Haiti were more vulnerable 
due to the loss of clean water, food, shelter, and sufficient medical supplies. And if someone got cholera, they could die within 24 hours. The cholera outbreak infected 665,000 people and killed 8,183 people. However, I will say that is the data I was able to find and I'm a bit suspicious that it is actually exactly 8,183. That's very specific. But the point is, that is a tragedy. And it demonstrates why we base the scale not on the actual magnitude of the event, but the outcome. Whether it's property damage or more importantly, the loss of human lives. And that leads into my other point, and that is some natural hazards trigger others. Just as the 2010 Haiti earthquake triggered a disease outbreak, the 2011 earthquake in Japan triggered a tsunami that traveled across the world. Hurricanes on their inland side can create tornadoes whereas on their other side they can create floods. A meteor crashing into the ocean can cause a tsunami that can flood a village and then cause a pandemic in that specific village whereas other ones might get a tsunami but not a pandemic. An earthquake can make a volcano erupt and the lava flowing can cause forest fires whereas the ash that spreads into the atmosphere can cause a global cooling that can kill crops in a completely different area of the earth and result in starvation. A natural hazard can cause another Another natural hazard that can cause another ha natural hazard or it can cause two separate natural hazards at the same time. The combinations are endless and terrifying and there are some things we can help mitigate such as forest fires we can help by not leaving fires unattended, maybe not prevent the ones created by volcano eruptions but you know, you know what I mean. But when it comes to something like an earthquake we can only prepare by making the best buildings possible. Also there are concurrent natural hazards which is when two natural hazards occur at the same time but they are unrelated and it's just really bad luck. This is a synergenic event aka a terrible coincidence. However the risk of death does not end after the event. Homes damaged from an earthquake can still be at risk of collapsing any time after the actual earthquake. The lack of clean water, food, shelter, and medicine makes the population vulnerable to a disease outbreak. And the large amount of dead bodies after the event also makes the population more vulnerable to a disease outbreak, which is why after a lot of severe natural hazards, when there's a lot of dead, they are all put into one mass grave as quickly as possible. It's tragic and sad, but that's what is done so that the surviving people do not die. The tragedy does not end after the event, and if you write this, you need to know this. And though all events cannot be prevented, some threats can be mitigated. Some societal factors that exasperate vulnerability are one, the population bomb, the extreme increase in the population of humans on Earth, Number two, degradation of natural resources, such as cutting down the forest on a mountain makes it more likely there's going to be a landslide. And number three, socioeconomic factors. Just as I said before, a poorer nation has less money to use to make better buildings and they have less money for aid. And this also can apply to on the community level. However, these three things are not entirely black or white. Between 1961 and 1964, about one in every 10,000 people were killed in a natural hazard. Whereas between 2000 and 2004, the population had doubled. However, the amount of people killed in a natural hazard had decreased to one in every 100,000. So though more people died, the percent of people who died decreased. And some of it is just has to do with if there's more people, there's more of them to die. So of course, more people are going to die. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the increasing population increases the risk on each individual person. So an individual person was less likely to die from a natural hazard. And the lower death weight could be a result of technological advancements, a better economy, or maybe just a lower percent of people lived in the dangerous areas and it's just lucky. But the point is, it isn't a clear solution of like, oh, have less kids because yeah, of course, if there's less people, less people are going to die. But it doesn't mean that it's better to be a human being. It just means that there's less people to die in the first place. So, duh. Also, when it comes to degradation of the natural environment, 
This doesn't mean that humans always have a negative effect on the environment. A great example of a positive effect humans have are Native Americans in North America, when historically they used to have controlled burns in the forest in order to modify the landscape. This resulted in less massively deadly forest fires because they would burn the underbrush regularly, keeping it fairly clean and preventing the buildup of things to burn. <laughs> so this is a great example of how people caused natural hazards, which in turn prevented worse natural hazards and helped the environment. However, since then, in North America, the United States had a policy of preventing all fires, which in turn resulted in tons of... Also, to be honest, I cannot think of an advantage of being of a lower socioeconomic fat status. Also, again, poor communities are more at risk due to having weaker infrastructure and less support. Also, urban wildlife interface does create another risk, especially for forest fires, because if your house is in the forest and then the forest catches fire, you're SOL. Then again, if you're in a city, then disease outbreaks are a lot more of a risk, especially if it's not a clean city. There's a lot more things to fall on your head. Then again, trees can also fall on top of you. And if you live by a mountain, that can collapse on you. But if you live on the shore, you might get a flood or you might get a hurricane and the hurricane could also cause a tornado but if you live in the open prairie then you're also at risk for a tornado so the point is nowhere is safe <laughs> and living by a volcano is a bold move so in conclusion there's no certainty of safety no matter where you are i'm making myself paranoid again anyway that's my introduction to natural hazards i hope you enjoyed this and found it informative and also if there are any specific natural hazards that i drew that you specifically are planning on writing soon or are just interested in please let me know and i will make a video about that one sooner rather than later also if you're including one in your story please tell me because i'm super interested in that but yeah thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed this luckily i live in a relatively safe area unless the super volcano in yellowstone erupts later